Hello, I am Sergio Louise Anderson, and today we're going to be doing an interview with Azrael Rene. Um, welcome. Um, uh, just a little reminder, if you are curious about pole dancing or you're a beginner pole dancer, uh, just at the beginning of your journey, then hop on over to my um, uh, profile because I do have a free gift for you guys over in the links in my bio. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. So excited to talk to Azrael Renee, and I'm going to bring her on right now. She has a really unique take and um, experience uh, with pole dancing, and I would love to talk to her about it. Here we go. She's coming on right now. We'll see where she is in the world right now. Hi, how's it going, Azrael? Hi, Sergia. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Yeah, absolutely. So I, so I know you're quite a nomad. Where are we seeing you today? <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm like flipping it on you. <laughs> um, right now, I'm actually in California um, visiting family. So um, I have my loop it pole set up in the backyard over here. And uh, yeah, just enjoying a little downtime from the travels. Nice. Where where did you grow up in California? Is your, your family from California? Um, part of my family is from California. Uh, my mother is originally from Mexico, and her side of the family moved to California. I was born in Tennessee and grew up from Florida, California, so many spaces in between. Uh, so very fortunate. Yeah, so that's so it's kind of like you were nomadic even as a kid and that has kind of like yeah. throughout your life. <laughs> oh for sure um I think you kind of become uh a, not so much so callous to saying goodbye to people and moving it's always difficult it doesn't get more easy but I think you growing up in that scenario whether you're nomadic for this reason or that um you get the tools necessary to to make those things a little easier so we have learned yeah absolutely so do you spend most of your time on the road uh right now it's pretty split between um i'm at home working on my first book uh for the last two years now i've gotten about half of it done so that's taken a lot of my time off of the road um but other than that i am on the road seeing as many new places as possible putting together projects um, yeah, so it's a little bit of a mix right now, which I enjoy, and I'll be a little heartbroken if that ever changes, so trying to keep that on, on the same path. That's so neat. Well, I can't wait to talk to you about your book. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm working on two. The first one is a fiction short story book, which should be out uh, the beginning of next year, so hopefully springtime. And the second one should be done by the end of next year. And it is a nonfiction short story book, um, which is taking a long time. Nonfiction books take a while to write. There's so much fact checking and legality behind it that you really have to cover all of your bases. Um, so it is taking a chunk of time, but I really feel like this is what I want to be doing. So worth it. Definitely worth it. Wow, that's so interesting. So you're a writer. It must be great to be moving throughout spaces and being able to write in different places probably gives you that, that um, creativity you need to always be moving oh, yeah. around. Yeah, it's fantastic to have your office be, you know, a beach shoreline one day, you're in the woods the next day, you're at your abuela's house the, another day. So um, I'm definitely keeping the inspiration going. Uh, and like I said, this is uh, something, you know, just traveling, being on the road, meeting new people. These are inspirations that I've been getting since I was young. So it's kind of fantastic to finally be able to transmute that into something tangible, like a tangible art. Yeah. How neat. Well, I hear you have quite an interesting relationship with pole as far as like your exposure to yes. it, everything. And I just want to go there right away. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. So I grew up around pole dancing um, before it became a mainstream fad. Um, like, as you know, like competitions in the early 2000s really started pushing uh, to make it this fitness, which is uh, amazing. 
Um, and when I was growing up with it, it was still one. <laughs> Sorry, I have the cat kind of <laughs> making her rounds on me. Um, so when I grew up, it was my mother is an indigenous woman. She was a pole dancer throughout the 90s to put food on the table to pay rent. Um, my father was a DJ at the strip clubs for a while. And um, I remember growing up and it being this kind of a uh, hush hush thing, things that you didn't want people to know about something that we should almost be ashamed of. Um, and I think that kind of boils down to society uh, almost implies that there's something innately wrong with feminine sexuality. And so we're at this amazing place now where people can just pull with their friends. Like I had my loop it set up um, last night and my little cousin and my aunt were just monkeying around on it. And so it's so beautiful to see it blossom into something that everyone is able to participate in and take advantage of. I also think with that said, it is important to acknowledge not only the origin of this art, but the communities that help keep it afloat. Um, uh, it was outlawed in New York. Pole dancing was outlawed in New York in 1937. You know, these are, there are communities that have kept this alive despite it being demonized, despite it being frowned upon in our society. And those are inherently um, lower income, minority, female sex workers. And so I grew up where that was something that wasn't yet empowered. We didn't have a Cardi B yet. <laughs> and so um, it is something that my relationship with pole has evolved over time and is still in evolving. I'm a pole novice. I'm by no means an expert or professional. I'm still learning. Um, but I do remember the women who would come to my fifth birthday party and bring me Barbies and stuff. They were all of these just really amazing, empowered, pole dancing, exotic dancing women. Um, but they didn't have, I think, the opportunity to really be in society's mainstream spotlight in a positive way. And so I do want to offer up uh, so much respect to these communities who have kept it alive. Um, and it, you see it happening in a lot of other things that are going mainstream in the world, cannabis, yoga, um, all of these things that have become very mainstream whitewashed to where we are forgetting to acknowledge the origins. We are forgetting to acknowledge the people who kept these things afloat despite, you know, uh, governmental sanctions against them. They fought the law. <laughs> like, you know, there are people who literally went against the law to exotic dance, which is why we are able to do it in such a beautiful, oftentimes non-sexualized format today. Um, so it's, I think, a big ups to them. I do want to just get all that off of my chest uh, <laughs> because now I am in a place where I'm so proud that my mother was a pole dancer. I am so proud that my mother was an exotic dancer. You know, um, this it takes strength, you know, yeah, like, you know, it, it takes strength. It takes guts to perform in front of people. It, hold on, Willie. Um, <laughs> just rubbing against the tripod. <laughs> so, yeah, um, my experience with pole dancing as a kid started very much in this um, be ashamed, hush, hush manner. But it was also something that the same people who were going, hush, hush, this is inappropriate, are coming to the clubs and paying money <laughs> and so I saw this almost like um like contradictory a contradictory world when I was a kid being a kid of the nightlife you know no one's seeing their daddies and mommies run off to these clubs to pay these dancers but they are hearing their parents go this is inappropriate you better go to college or else you'll end up on a pole like those types of things um so there was a it was a very big dichotomy hear that kind of thing at growing up yeah. did you did you ever experience that kind of um, that kind of talk like when you were growing up? So I remember for the first, you know what I mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Will you repeat that? My head oh, yeah. Just like as as you were growing up and and, you know, your parents being in that kind of nightlife. I'm, I'm curious as to what your experience was. It was a child when you came up upon, you know, kind of uh, uncomfortable situations like that. Yeah. 
Uh, so for the most part, I don't think many people even knew my mother was an exotic dancer. Um, like I said, we kept it pretty, pretty low. My parents were pretty antisocial via other parents. So it's not like they were all hanging out at potlucks and parent teacher conferences. Um, the first time I had heard it mentioned, it's not that I hadn't known. I mean, we picked my mother, we dropped my mother off for work sometimes. Uh, we've had her coworkers at our birthday parties. Um, I was more aghast that anyone even knew. Um, yeah. And so I, I wasn't sure how to handle it when it was first, you know, kind of brought in front of me in public as a child. And that was heartbreaking. You know what I mean? It is heartbreaking because that is a person's parent. That's someone who's trying to put food on the table with a profession that dates back to prehistory being written. You know, strip keys are mentioned in the Bible, King Herod and Mark and Matthew, like he receives a strip tease. Like, and it's not like the woman wasn't frowned upon. She was just offering a service in society that everyone participated not plenty of people participated in at the time ancient sumeria the goddess anana she does a strip tease through the underworld like this is ancient stuff and this is stuff that is based in sexuality it does not have to be sexual but we are taught that anything that is relating to sexuality is something that should be ashamed like we shouldn't mention it we should be ashamed of it um and i just grew up in these contradictory worlds. So I wasn't sure how to navigate it. And now yeah. that I'm getting older, the end of my 20s, like I'm finding more eloquent ways to speak about it with people to bring it up. I've obviously read into the history of it a lot, uh, just to make sure that other people who were in scenarios like I was as a kid, women who are pole dancing, understand that this is nothing to be ashamed of. This is one of the oldest professions in one way or another. Um, and it takes a badass to be able to do it strength wise, mental wise, to be graceful and uh, do the same things that most men, most people, sorry, would struggle to do. Most people who fit into that perfect mainstream societal bubble. Yeah. What, do you have a, do you have a memory about, you know, it kind of sounds like, um, it, you know, you, you know, your Tia's at your potlucks and stuff like that were, were yeah. you know, dancers and strippers and stuff like that. Was there a moment that you remember like in your childhood that something was said, not necessarily even about mm. you family or anything like that? Cause it sounds like it was, you know, unfortunately pretty hush hush within yeah. your family. But do you remember a moment in your life that someone exercised an opinion in front of you about mm. thing and you were like, oh, um, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I'm curious as to like, yeah, personally came up uh, upon maybe someone talking bad about a sex worker or something and that and how that affected you. Um, I believe the first time that it came up wasn't in front of family. It was another time mentioned in front of kids from school, which mm -hmm. made me lead to believe that their dads were at the strip club, because how else would you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we were walking home from the bus stop with this other group of kids. And I remember it was like a backhanded comment from one of the other girls about my mother. And I didn't have the historical knowledge. I didn't have the societal know-how or the eloquence to yet really come back with something. But I remember just feeling anger. So she actually threw my arms. About your mother. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then just like women like her, like her was the wow. phrase used, you know, and um, really, and I just remember feeling this innate anger to where like, I didn't believe my mother was doing anything wrong. Um, the people who were normal suburban parents were coming to the clubs to participate in my mother's job, you know, like to literally pay her for to, to watch her dance. And so I, I was, I was confused. I was angry. And I remember from that moment on me going like, okay, so I don't want to be a pole dancer. And I know, yeah, I, it was one of those, 
I was probably seven or eight. Oh, wow. So young. Yeah, seven or eight. And I just remember going like, I'm going to college because pole dancers don't go to college. Wow. Like, I know. It was one of those things that became ingrained with me where one couldn't be the other. And let's skip to now where I have like friends who have put themselves through college by pole dancing or put themselves through medical school by pole dancing. Um, I know now that that is very much not the case. But when I was younger, despite adoring dancing, I really tried to stay separate from any type of like dancing involving a pole, exotic dancing, things like that, things that I inherently find beautiful, absolutely what, beautiful. What, what did, did that create any, like what, did that create any type of interesting dynamic between you and your mother, uh, your relationship with her growing up, like after, yeah. you know, old or even into your teens? I think that maybe as, when I was a child, she thought I frowned upon her or what she did. Um, and I really didn't. I never, I ended up getting a full ride scholarship and going to college and, you know, doing all of the mainstream nine to five bullshit stuff that I thought like, this will bring you happiness. This brings you at least stability, you know, um, <laughs> it doesn't, but I, I think that there might have been a, oh, I think I'm better than that. I just want to make sure I'm never pole dancing to make my ends meet type of feeling between us. And now I'm to the point where, you know, I've, I dropped out of my PhD program. I'm traveling the world. I pole dance for fun. I, think, um, I am very much of that community. I was just the kid who... It was already tough enough living down south, being indigenous, um, being a mixed baby, like being low income. And there are all these things that kind of stack up on you. And so you, as a kid going through these traumas, just want to shed some of them. And it's either by pretending you're not this or that, trying to fit in with the mainstream as much as possible. And that included, for my part, um, distancing myself from what my mother had to do when she was younger, had to do, wanted to do. She loves dancing. Like it's not this burden. It's this really cool, really amazing community of women and men who, who offer a service that is exciting. That is, is tough to learn yourself. Like now that I'm a pole novice, like really just now stringing together tricks to make cohesive flows. Uh, I have even more respect <laughs> because she did this, so seamlessly you know she was so graceful she was so beautiful um and so i have a lot of um a lot of things to repent for um and i think doing things like participating in poll like sharing the art with other people like talking to badass females who are integrated in the community is one of those ways to do it but i know that there is Many, many other girls, many other boys out there who grew up with their parents in this community. And like mm -hmm. I said, like it becoming a mainstream fad wasn't a thing until the mid 2010. So I remember seeing a pole competition advertised for the first time in the early 2000s. And I was, <laughs> like, I was just shocked because like because of the things people had said when I was younger there's no way that these normal suburban housewives are now trying to participate on the same thing they demonized my mother for um and so it was a lot of mixed emotions I was upset at it but I was happy and like liberated almost and so it's yeah it's a little bit of a mixed bag with feelings go but at the end of the day it's good it's very I love good Talk more about that time for you because all right so you know you how old were you in those early like when you in this you know in 2000 like when that was you were still quite young yeah I was pre-teens early teens pre -teen. you were yeah. pre -teen when the, oh my gosh yeah. oh my so <laughs> I know more about that like experience that anger and how you moved through that and what mm -hmm. that did your relationship with your own family and the dynamic mm -hmm. of your own family and what that did for your pole journey. Like, 
Um, when did you then decide that you were kind of curious yourself about this and move towards it in that way? Um, yeah, I just would love to know because I mean, you were preteen when you saw that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like I said, a lot of emotions <laughs> already hitting puberty. So there were emotions there anyways, but they were just expedited for that type of thing. My family has always been on the opposite side of the mainstream, you know, um, my family was growing and selling cannabis before cannabis was a thing. Um, my grandfather on my mother's side was a coyote. So shuttling immigrants and cannabis over the border. We've always been not, I fought the law and the law one type of scenario, but something that's pretty on point with that. Um, and so my family's always been the one to preach a lot of what the information we're receiving from our mainstream governmental sources might not always be in our best interest. Like I remember in the nineties when the food pyramid was the thing you remember where it's like the giant bottom, just full of breads. <laughs> like, yeah. um, and I remember my Irish grandmother saying like, this is not correct. And we go like, Nana, it's science. Like it's <laughs> correct. And she goes, no, no. <laughs> like, and then I find I get older and I find out that the bread companies, the bread corporations lobbied yeah, scientists. They, <laughs> oh, they paid money to change scientific facts. Um, so what this has to do with pole dancing is a lot of the things that my family did, I tried to just do the opposite. I was like a little goody good white sheep in a family of black sheep, uh, which isn't as cool as the other way around. It really isn't. Um, and... I tried doing everything mainstream as really shit as that is. I tried to do, I tried to pass for white, which I do very well because we have white skin. Um, I tried to fit in with what I thought my skill sets would best be in a normal job. So I went to school, I was getting my PhD in human behavior analytics for criminology. Cause I was like, this is where I can help participate. Um, and then you quickly find out that, you can't change a system that is designed to prevent change. And so the artists, the people who break the rules with what they enjoy doing, with things that come from their, their sacral area, with things that are things that you kind of wanted to do when you were younger, but it, it mixes in with the realities of society. My mom always wanted to be a dancer. With the realities of society, it's not very likely that she a young indigenous low income woman would be able to be a prima ballerina. And so she took with what she had and she became an exotic dancer. And that is a wonderful way of making it work. <laughs> and so I think that when this started to come about in the early mid 2010s as like a mainstream non-sexual athletic fad, I was, I had to go back and question everything else I denied about my family, nice. everything. And that was my indigenous background, my dad's side, I'm Irish gypsy. Um, so that was my gypsy side that I tried to just repress uh, a lot of things, everything that I uh, once tried to avoid and <laughs> tried to bury deep down really started screaming to the surface. And yes. I think it, it I'm coming sorry. it's like you couldn't, you couldn't avert your eyes. It was right there in front of you yeah. as a teen and you were like, you yeah. know, like approached with this and just, wow. Yeah. Keep telling me about, yeah, about that. And Oh and yeah. That's, um, I think, I think it really hit a peak as I was in undergraduate college. I think that's when my soul, like your soul will burn down the world to speak to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> like If you are not listening, it will make you listen. <laughs> so Oh, yeah. Um, I, so I think that peak in college, but it really started around those early teen years when things started to come into play for the mainstream society as this is good. This is OK. Like we want to copy this. And you see that a lot um, with things in the music world, with, the, you know, with, with hip hop, it's very demonized. But then at the same time, it's like sign my CD. You're you know, what do you want from us? Um, it was, it, like, you know, it was I think like a lot about, um, you know, like Argentine tango and even, um, like ballroom 
indigenous cultures and then being yeah. kind of changed, you know, through, you know, into different styles and, exactly. you know, even if you go way, 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 way back ballet, you know, not it being what it is today. Mm -hmm. but yeah. It's just, it gives me a little reminder about that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, like going back to origins of the pole, as we know it, you know, everyone is, is pulling from so many different modern pole pulls from so many different influences and things like that, that I think the origins really get buried. And the origins are just as exciting, just as beautiful, and something that should be acknowledged at the forefront of the sport. And like I said, with tons of other things that are happening in our society today um, that are going mainstream, kind of started around the same time, not long after pole started to become a fitness fad, uh, cannabis started to hit the mainstream as like something that was okay, you know, at least CBD or at least a two to one mixture. And, then, and now <laughs> it's just cannabis is okay. And it's one of those things that I remember uh, my dad being in jail for a good chunk of my childhood for. Um, and so, yeah, everything started to come into questioning. And I think within that 10 year, 12 year period from early teens through college, um, I had to unlearn a lot of ingrained, just a lot of indoctrination that I had gone through because I watched my family who participated in certain things suffer and I didn't want them to suffer. I wanted to be the one to buy them property and everyone can retire and just live like a normal life in, in my view, normal, which is living off the land doing what we're here to do as humans, enjoying ourselves, creating, helping each other, uh, restructuring society in a way that is equal for everyone. Um, my normal. <laughs> So uh, it makes it difficult to be that person, to do that kind of come up in a society that is negating a lot of that and yet worships these key people and demonizes everyone else for it. So you have a couple of hip hop artists, which everyone goes like, this is the stuff like this is, you know, look how amazing their music videos. There's a woman pole dancing in the music videos and da da da, And then you see that in real life and it's like, oh, you better go to college so you don't end up as that girl. And I had to unlearn so much of that. I made friends who were doing both, who were just smart and gorgeous and talented, who were doing both worlds, who were going to med school and dancing, who were you know, doing these incredible things that I thought were contradictory to a, a whole different set of skills. Um, they're not. <laughs> so... Yeah, a lot to still learn, um, but I have loved the unlearning process. And there are a lot of these women who I owe so many good moments in my childhood to. So many beautiful, intimate, innocent moments. And um, that's what their job was. You know, they were just a pole dancer. It was just their job. Yeah. Wow. This is This is just such a cool conversation. I just love... Uh, I just love hearing about it from this perspective, you know, because, you know, I came into the pole world in around 2010 mm. and watching it and, you know, c coming into it and then watching it evolve over that yeah. amount. Of time. And pole has been a part of your life, your whole life. Uh, do you, you know, brothers and sisters and what was the dynamic between, you know, did everyone take that information in differently mm. or to see things change? I can imagine there was a lot of. Yeah confusion and anger you know when things started to go mainstream and you were like what my dad was in jail for this my yeah. mom was for this I was teased for this mm. um I have two younger brothers and uh the youngest is a little too young to remember that like he knows all the information uh, my brother closest to me in age very much remembers things and I think that my brothers ended up just being the coolest guys. They are the epitome of female power. I was suggesting a TV show to one of my brothers and I was like, oh, it's like, a, it's a female stoner comedy. And he goes, so a stoner comedy. Like he just, you know, it doesn't register that to them that like women have to have like special sex in order, like S-E-C-T-S, <laughs> special <laughs> sex in order to uh, do things, accomplish things. They are very respectful they are very ingrained with the idea that women are strong women are powerful women are 
probably more patient than men in all scenarios. Um, yeah, they ended up just becoming very well-rounded, uh, very conscious, compassionate individuals. So I, <laughs> my shaking my head like, how did that happen? But um, <laughs> no, it it makes a lot of sense because they they grew up with a mother who is my my mother was very stoic, um, indigenous being indigenous in the current climate current climate for the last five hundred years <laughs> um, is it's tough and uh, there's not a lot of emotional room to open yourself in public in mainstream society as an indigenous woman without in some way being cut or hurt and that was very much my mother so she was very tough um just on herself you saw things kind of working in her mind all the time and so but she's very stoic very tough and then i was very much a tomboy doing backflips off of things and like getting lost in the woods for the day and so my brothers had this very different view of what a woman should be, of what a girl should be. And so now when, you know, they've got, now they're older, they're in their 20s, they're in the world, they're dating, um, they have higher expectations for what a woman is capable of than I think your average Western mainstream male. Um, and I love that. I absolutely love that. So I think in the end, pole has only really been a benefit to us in our upbringing. It's made us uh, much more compassionate. It's made us more open-minded. It's made us question things. Mm -hmm. And I could not have asked for a better lineup with that because it could be for anything. And pole is so beautiful and it's so fun. And so reconnecting to that is, it's a treat. Did you get to see your mom, um, uh, react to the changes that you saw with mm. were accepted you know like yeah you get what did you witness when it came to your mom's perspective so my mother in the early 2000s uh, my parents were separated and I lived with my father so I didn't get to really delve into her emotions and her feelings. And even so, like I said, she's a very stoic individual. So if something is bothering her or um, upsetting her, it's very much internalized. It's kept in. Um, and like I said, that's that patience that has kind of kept indigenous people afloat for the last 500 years. So mm -hmm. I don't really, I've never really pried too much um, but it is something that, yeah, we should probably chat about in the future. And I hope she feels empowered. I hope she feels, I told you so. I hope she feels <laughs> all of these good things that she should feel. Um, because I know when I was younger, it wasn't necessarily that. And she deserves that. Women who, like I said, these women have kept this art afloat. These women, the ones who are deemed sex workers, are the ones who, it's the reason we have literal gyms with like 20 poles in them. And women of all calibers, housewives, bachelorette parties, college girls, girls who just want to try it out, girls who want to get in shape, not girls. <laughs> Everyone is able to participate in this art. Because these women, you know, it's not just my mother. There is a whole multiple generations of women who have fought to keep food on the table, who have fought to do a job, which the same people who are outlawing it are the people who are at the higher end strip clubs, like going in and watching these dancers. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of hypocrisy behind the lawmaking when it comes to exotic dance and pole dance and things, even sex work, um, because these same lawmakers are the ones participating in it quite often. Um, you see it happen on the news, you see it happen all over the place. Um, you would see them come into the clubs and we'd get stories about politicians or movie stars and things like that coming into the clubs where my parents worked at the time. So it, um, yeah, there are, there's just a huge group of women and their children out there who have, who were a part of this process, who, who don't even know 
that they were a part of the process of making this mainstream. Um, and I just would love to, as with so many other things in our society, like reparations, <laughs> reparations for the suffering. Um, yeah. And so I think getting the education out there as far as the communities who kept it afloat is the first step to that. I don't necessarily know if we could ever, you know, pay them back for what they've done um, as far as this art goes. But um, yeah, it's a start just getting the information and being respectful, understanding that feminine sexuality, that sexuality in general is not inherently bad. It is something that has been around since ancient times, ancient Greeks and Romans. They had strip teases at their religious festivals. So like, this is, this is a job. This is a job that people participate in and there's nothing wrong with sexuality being a part of that job. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you remember the first time that you personally moved or had the urge to move towards pole mm -hmm. and at that what you know what that brought on for you um I've always thought it was something William come rub on me and not the pole <laughs> like literally my tripod is the only thing she wants yep. to rub herself on <laughs> I know <laughs> um I think when so when I was younger it is always something that I thought was gorgeous and always something that I innately knew that I wanted to do um, especially because, you know, when I was younger, trying to be this little whitewashed bunny um, in this family of badasses, I was trying to do ballet and ballroom and uh, belly dancing for a while. And then you start to see how all of these different dances. Dancing with yes. <laughs> It is literally, you start to see how the Roomba, it like correlates to certain moves in pole dancing. And you're just like, wait a second, <laughs> like, wait a second. And then it's almost like, um, like pit bulldogs, like not to go off on another metaphorical tangent, but before pitties, it was Rottweilers who were the demonized, like fighting dog breeds. And before them, it was German shepherds and da, 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 da. And so before ballroom, you saw like these little Egypt shows in the United States since like the sixties, where it was like these traveling little circuses and it was just exotic dance, you know? So before pole dancing, it was just the strip tease. Before the strip tease, it was certain Hispanic ballroom dances, like the rumba, like the tango, like um, all of these things were deemed overtly sexual, like, you know, keep them away from your family. Um, so pole dancing, I feel is really just the next, genesis of like the you know I'm not sure what it's going to be next but it, it'll something else will be like oh pole dancing is okay but you know it's not okay like this dance and so um I remember doing the ballroom dancing and there was one set of choreography in the Roomba where you're basically using a human man like a pole <laughs> and and I remember thinking like, oh, I think pole might be something I want to get into um, as I get older. And again, that didn't really take a peek until after college, which is, which is a long time. <laughs> your mom, when you went to go take your first pole class? No, I should, yeah, I definitely should have. I think it would have brought us closer. Um, but my first pole class was in like this little dingy garage and it was just me and a couple of girlfriends and this woman who like on Craigslist was like, I teach pole. And you're like, it's just like not even a pole dancing pole. It was like one of the poles in her garage. <laughs> like, I know, didn't spin. It was like painted, you know, like with the rest of the garage, it like was way too big, way too big for an actual pole dancing pole. Um, and it was her just doing the moves and the spins around it. And I couldn't help but to laugh because I was like, of course, of course, this is my first experience. It could have been in a more like mainstream class setting, but here we are. So. Yeah. How <laughs> and when was that? That was in college, and then I didn't really decide, like, okay, this is a, something I'm picking up for myself regularly until after. So I think that was, like, my second or third year of university, undergrad university, 
and then um, dropped out of my first year PhD. And um, I was just kind of like, okay, I need some hobbies. I need a way to stay in shape because I'm no longer competing in sports. Um, dance, like dance has always been my jam. Dance has been something that the women in my family have loved for generations. Just the people in my family, my younger cousin, um, Alice, he's a little boy. He probably cut it up the best on the pole last night. Um, like, and he's like seven. And so it's become something that is, whereas my family used to never speak of it. Now it's like a jokey thing that we do off to the side um, with each other. And so, uh, yeah, grow, change. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And what about, um, so you got, you grew up dancing. Um, and I know that your mom's original dream was to be, to have some kind of, you know, instruction in that way or to dance, maybe some of the, you were dancing as a kid. What was that like for her? Was she a huge mm -hmm. um, influence on getting you into those kind of classes that you wanted to take or in your childhood, stuff like that? Uh, so as far as any and all of like the hobbies and sports my brothers and I got into when we were younger um they didn't really need my parents didn't really need to push or influence us much because we wanted to do everything we wanted to be the best at everything we wanted a wide breadth of just skill sets to pull from like practical ones fun ones uh so she didn't really have to push or try to influence me towards the sport so much but she herself did influence it my mother is a beautiful graceful woman who would dance around the house she would dance at the beach when we went out she would dance in lines at the grocery stores and gorgeous movements like even the little dances she was doing to herself in line were seamless you know the body rolls were seamless the belly dancing influence was there um just to watch her is to be inspired and uh, so that kind of got me up and going because I was like, that is her. Look at her. She's beautiful. I'm made of her. I can do that too. Um, and I think that was kind of the main influence for it. Um, I didn't really have so much, a lot of famous people um, influencing me. I think the few dancers that I really enjoyed were the ones who were famous for being a little sexual like when I was younger uh, Shakira in the 90s everyone was in love with her because she's this Hispanic woman who could roll her body in these beautiful ways and so that kind of should have been a hint that <laughs> this is the type of thing I do want to do as I get older there are just some indoctrinated beliefs that I had to unlearn um, and then you what was the next major person was Cardi B Cardi B was a stripper who is now a mainstream, talented musician, cool mom, cool person who's involved in politics. And I just remember her being in college so unapologetic about what she did, not only unapologetic, but proud and stoked that she was a stripper. And that made me go like, I think that was kind of like that last little nail in the coffin of those beliefs of those ingrained beliefs that this isn't something that respectable people do or successful people do. Um, yeah, even though it was right there, you know, my whole childhood, but I think it being right there and my family having suffered so much, I just went, everything that's involved with my childhood goes to the side. Like we're not doing any of that. But then I tried pull for the first time. I tried weed for the first time. I tried a lot of great things in college um that I should have really I think been participating in the whole time but having that mindset allowed me to really be like behind enemy lines almost to really see the origins of these beliefs to see where these ideas in societies where these laws are coming from to look at the history of the things and the more you learn about the history the more you learn about the socio-psychology behind everything the more you're like oh these stereotypes are bullshit. <laughs> like, they're absolutely bullshit. They're so hypocritical. Um, so as far as mainstream influences, they started to trickle in as the sport grew. Um, but my mom was definitely the influence in her own way, in her own non-intentional way for dancing for me. Wow. I just, full circle. <laughs> and such a beautiful, interesting, wonderful conversation. It sounds like 
you know, from your experience, this is going to be something that you grow mm. through and your the whole rest of your life. I mean, you're still so young yeah. at the beginning of your own pole journey and um, what a beautiful, I just feel so grateful to be able to have this conversation with you and to hear. Oh my gosh, same, thank you. It's, I just, I just love it. I just love that it's out there and I think everyone should hear it. So um, thank you for joining us today. We have to wrap yeah. up, really go on with you about this forever. And I know I've been seeing <laughs> awesome comments come through and people are like, wow, that's so oh, interesting. Cool. You know? <laughs> I've been so here then, that I haven't really been focusing. Yeah, I know me too. I feel like we've been so in it and I just, um, I just, uh, I hope that we continue to get to hear you speak about your personal experience um, with this. Where is the best place that we can follow you and your adventures and your journey yeah. through this? Uh, thank you so much for asking. Yeah, my Instagram that I uh, got on today with, Azriel Renee, is probably the best place to check out what I'm doing and reach me. I also have a blog Instagram, She Breathes Fire. So if anyone is more interested in base jumping and world travel and things like that, that is where you go to see my crazy side. Uh, but a lot more poll will be coming up on the Azriel Renee account. So yeah, thank you so much, Sergia. Like, this is so much fun. Honestly, this is the first time I've gotten to speak about this publicly. Oh. So exciting and terrifying and all of the wonderful, wonderful things that make conversations good. Yeah, so. I'm so grateful. I feel like, you know, um, I would love to, you know, down the road, even get to hear about the continuous journey and the relationship that you have with yeah. your mom, relations that you have had with your family about this. So we'll probably have to touch base again, but I just Please. thank you so much, Azrael. And thank you everyone for joining us. This has just thank been a conversation. Please share it with your friends, um, with your family, because I think it's a conversation that it's, it's really important for people to hear. So yeah. To everyone around the world, Azrael, thank you so much again. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a beautiful week. You too. Thanks, guys. Bye.